So hi, everyone. I'm Marissa Evangelista. I am an MFA intern, and I will be your host tonight for We'll Talk with Artists. Our digital discussion tonight is with printmaker Jim Earl. Jim Earl was first a scientist before he also became an artist. Jim merged the precision of science and the freedom of art into his printmaking processes, which include intaglio and silkscreen. He explores novel ways to make marks on paper and organizes them into coherent images. Additionally, I'd like to introduce the host of our show, Will Scott. Will is an art historian with an extensive career as a photographer and the former head of adult programs in the National Gallery of Art. He is uniquely qualified to bridge the gap between artists and the public. All right, Marissa, thank you for that introduction. And uh, more importantly, thank you, Jim, for agreeing to sit down and uh, uh, have this conversation with me. And we will be able to record this, edit it, and then share it as we've done the other live talks uh, over our uh, social media platforms. So, Jim, <laughs> before we really dive in, you and I were just a moment ago talking about your experience uh, as a professor and, and speaking in the classroom. Can you just sort of quickly tell us uh, what your field was and where you taught and how maybe, you know, whatever you'd like to offer about that uh, part of your uh, life. My field of, ex of physics expertise uh, is space physics. And I was uh, working in that field with a huge ground-based array of detectors at MIT where I did my thesis. And this was in the 1950s before there were any satellites. And uh, then on graduating, or not graduating, but uh, getting my PhD, I moved to the University of Minnesota, uh, where I had car carried on with uh, experimental physics flying balloons, which was a special expertise that is almost uniquely available, was almost uniquely available at Minnesota. And eventually uh, it got to a stage when I became 40 years old, uh, when I decided, well, you just can't do this balloon stuff anymore because uh, once the balloon is launched, that's just the, you, you, you've been up all night getting it ready to launch. And then once it's launched, that's just the beginning because you have mm -hmm. to uh, keep track of it for the whole day. So we're talking about 20 hour days of hard work. And uh, at the age of 40, I decided I was no longer qualified for that. <laughs> well, I, it didn't have anything to do with the cold winters in Minnesota? Oh, no, I'm uh, uh, not, uh, uh, not quite a native of Minnesota, but my family came from Minnesota. And so uh, I was completely familiar and inured to the cold winters. Yeah, well, good. Uh, let me let me ask you a couple of follow up questions before we uh, continue and go on to this slide uh, that illustrates your uh, balloon research. Um, in in Minnesota, was did you go there because of your family connection? Because they offered you the best career opportunity, or I'm kind of interested in whether was it because the skies are so much clearer, particularly that far back. Did that uh, assist in the research that you were doing? Uh, your... well, the, the sky had nothing to do with the research I was doing, the color of the sky. Okay. But uh, it was a good offer, and the uh, family connection in Minneapolis was another motivating factor. But uh, it just seemed like a natural thing to do. Sure. Sure. And did you come directly uh, to Maryland after you left Minnesota? Yeah, yes, I did. To uh, Hopkins, was it? What, what's that? Was it Johns oh, Hopkins? No, it was uh, the University of Maryland in College Park. 
And did you continue there and retire from the University of Maryland then? Yes, I continued for a long time, 40 years or so. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's great. I think it's uh, fascinating to have a little bit of information about your career as a scientist, because it is a big jump in the minds of many listeners, I think, and, and in my mind, to jump from uh, a sort of a theoretical science like physics. And please, I don't mean to offend if you think it's less, it's not so theoretical. <laughs> um, I may be misspeaking for my own lack of knowledge there, but it still seems like a big job, jump to go from science to uh, art and to be really rather capable almost immediately when you decided to make that transition. So first, before we talk about that, let's look at the balloon. And I want to know a little bit more about what's happening, what we're looking at. Uh, this shows the it was done at the uh, an airport in Minnesota, an abandoned airport in Minnesota, where the university uh, had uh, launched all their balloons. And this was rather early in the game. And uh, uh, this shows the huge balloon when all the helium gas it was going to get uh, is in it. And that's what that bubble at the top of the uh, screen is. That's the uh, the uh, balloon uh, at uh, the surface. And as it goes up, the helium that's pumped in at the beginning uh, expands and when it finally gets up to 25 miles above the earth, uh, the balloon is a, uh, a sphere and hanging underneath it on a parachute, which you can see uh, just above the horizon in this picture, uh, is the payload and uh, you can see me and a technician standing off to the uh, left waiting for the balloon to come and pick the payload out of our hands and take it up 25 miles. So that's the scenario. Uh, uh, I think this may have been the uh, a flight where the the rope holding the balloon or the pay payload to the bottom of the parachute got between my legs and so <laughs> a little bit dicey. Yeah, you might have gone for a little ride. Uh, well, uh, when I got home, my wife uh, said. Uh, well, how'd it go? And I said, well, not too well. They almost lost me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you answered my, my greatest personal curiosity, and that was to know whether you were among the figures on the ground. But just be so we can wrap up this part of our conversation, uh, the, the payload at some point is released, right? And the parachute lets it come safely back to the ground because what yeah. you have in there... Yes, uh, w when the flight is over, there's a explosive knife that cuts the parachute loose from the balloon and the package floats down under the parachute. And what you're doing in this type of experiment, this type of science is you're recording the, the traces of radiation. That's well, uh, they're cosmic rays. Yeah. And at that altitude, uh, the, the, uh, the cosmic rays are essentially pure primaries coming in from outer space. There are essentially no secondary cosmic rays like the ones that develop by the time they get near the uh, surface. And uh, so these were uh, uh, pictures of primary cosmic rays of several different types.
but I don't want to get into that very no. much. No, 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 no. You would, I know you'd lose me in about one sentence. So we'll, we'll move on. <laughs> so how about the uh, first image of uh, Jim's work, Marissa? After about uh, maybe 30 years of this, I decided that at the age of 40, I was too old to do these sorts of experiments where you have to stay up for two days. Yeah. And so we went to, uh, 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 I had a sabbatical at Caltech where my program was to forget about experimental physics and start <laughs> becoming a theoretical physicist. And that's what happened. I did not abandon physics. I just abandoned experiments. Uh, and Caltech is a beautiful campus. Uh, so you certainly picked a fine place to do that. Well, it's, it was a fine place. And uh, my mentor there who just died it's, was Randy Jacopi. Uh, but anyway, he was a young guy. Whereas as I was significantly older, but he was the mentor and I was the student. Yeah. And I learned a lot from him. Good, good. Well, this image, uh, of course, the most important thing about our conversation is what you have to share with us. But I just want to uh, say to you that I'm so impressed with this image for a number of reasons. And one of them is that it immediately reminded me as one of America's most famous graphic artists uh, in the 1930s uh, and uh, 20s. And his name was Earl Horger. And have you ever heard of this gentleman? I don't think so. Okay. He's not much remembered today for a lot of reasons we won't take the time to go into, but he had a similar um, uh, graphic language uh, and he was noted among many things for being the principal, the art director for Packard Automobiles. Oh, and yeah. they, they sent him to Europe to do a series, or no, excuse me, he was also the uh, art director, principal illustrator for Eberhard Faber Pencils. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, familiar with those. <laughs> great. And, and they sent him to Europe on an extended um, trip, paid for everything. And he was to go around Europe and record images of famous European landmarks like this cathedral. And your work is very similar. And I make this point mostly because here you are making a transition to the graphic arts and your work, in my opinion, could be put side by side with his and stand very well, the comparison. So I'm, this is very impressive. Now, tell us a little bit how you made the transition and got to the, being able to do something like this. Uh, well, I um, uh, started to take courses. Oh, well, there was the famous incident when uh, my wife and I went to the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And uh, there were these uh, lying around there. I was already very interested in art. But there were all these uh, Brillo boxes, looks like, <laughs> lying around. And I told Sylvia, my wife, to uh, come and take a look at them. And she said, nah, <laughs> just <laughs> discarded packing boxes. And But actually, they were Andy Warhol uh, silk screens. And uh, so, I looked at them very carefully, and when I came away, I said to myself, well, you can do that. And uh, so when we uh, got back home, Sylvia and I started to make silkscreen prints in our attic. This was before I had any uh, had been taught anything about art. I just did it on my own. And uh, that was uh, about exactly 50 years ago, because one other thing that we 
did uh, from California was we brought home our California baby uh, whose name is Matthew uh, Matthew Allen Earl and yeah I know Matt uh, uh, he is uh, uh, one of our neighbors in uh, Annapolis and uh, uh, is already making quite a bit of an impact but anyway so you can uh, tell Matt that I thought he was a little younger than <laughs> no, he's 50. Yeah, I, I, I would have pegged him for being about my son's age, which is around 40. But anyhow, that's not. Uh, but uh, let me um, uh, give you a few words on how this thing became created. And uh, it is uh, when I had developed this obsession with art. Uh, I came back to the University of Maryland, started taking classes, and uh, I decided, well, you, maybe you better learn how to draw a little bit. And so uh, the way that worked is that I started to make drawings in sketchbooks, and I'm going to show you the sketchbook drawing. Okay, here is uh, what it looks like. Uh, and uh, it's got a date on it. I forget what it is, but let me look here. 18 September 2007. So that was when I had already pretty much learned how to draw. Wow. And, that, that is a very fine drawing. Jim. And um, it, I have 12 sketchbooks. Wow. You can look at this and you can see this is book eight out of 12. But um, anyway, that's one way that I, but, and if you really look at, uh, compare the sketchbook and the uh, etching, they are absolutely identical, except maybe this little dark sky up in the corner. The creative process was making the drawing and the print is just a uh, photographic, not photographic, but uh, photo etching. Um, yeah, photo mechanical process for uh, yeah. transferring and enlarging. So I think that's about the end of that story. I mentioned the 12 sketchbooks. Okay, so what, yes, yeah, so what's the time frame? from going from making these drawings in the sketchbook and using this photo mechanical process to your own work on etching plates and directly creating the, the material. Uh, well, you're about to show a silk screen, aren't you? Yeah, let's see the next image, please, Marcy. This is one of my very early silk screen prints uh, that my wife and I did uh, in our attic, and uh, it was at the time that the Washington Metro was not actually running, but there was a uh, uh, photograph taken by a famous uh, Washington Post photographer, uh, uh, which he titled Metro Test because this is a picture he took of this metro train, uh, not during actual running, but uh, when they were testing out to make sure that it worked. Now, yeah. silk screening, excuse me for interrupting Jim, but silk screen is a medium where you also can use photo mechanical processes to transfer an image in another medium into silk screen. Uh, Did you do that with this? Uh, uh, you can do it, and I did do it, but not with this one. Oh, okay. This, this is uh, uh, purely created by hand. Uh, and the, uh, the point is that um, 
there, well, you count the colors, there's gray, yellow, blue, uh, black, four or five colors. Mm -hmm. And each one of them had its own individual uh, silk, screen, silk yeah. screen through which the corresponding color gets forced. So uh, there's quite an exercise getting all them to be registered right and uh, so that you come out with a coherent image and not a horrible mess. <laughs> well, here's where a couple of my uh, questions about your work that I've always had uh, come into play. And a few of them are art historical, but we'll put that aside for the moment. What I'm struck with here is that, as you've just explained it, it's a kind of laborious process. It requires a lot of um, patience, a lot of precision, and we associate those kinds of things with science, at least I do. So do you think your scientific background and training helped you transition to this kind of image making? Absolutely. Uh, my whole life has been uh, s spent fooling around with uh, uh, different things. Uh, when I was a child, I was uh, uh, making electronic things like radios and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I went on to MIT and started fooling around in the lab. And uh, so that's something, uh, so uh, it was a natural thing to continue on to this sort of uh, printmaking because it's essentially just the same as fooling around in a lab except yeah. for a different purpose. Jim, that's sort of the essence of what I've always wondered about in your work because you're only ratifying my some of my assumptions in that your precision, your clarity, and your sort of deliberate approach in a medium that is very technical, uh, it, where did that come from? And you're essentially telling me it's both in your personality, but also in your uh, professional career that you were in a way prepared to do this. Yes, and even before my professional career. Now here's my art historical question to you. Um, and you had to know something like this was coming. How familiar were you, or were you familiar at all, with American artists of the 40s, 50s, and 60s who were called the Precisionists? Uh, well, uh, name a few, and I'll... Charles uh, Sheeler? Uh, very familiar. Yeah. And very much influenced by him. So this would be roughly the 70s you were doing this? Um, this image? Well, you subtract 50 from today. Yes, that would be the yeah. 70s. Yeah. So the latter part of Sheeler's career, he had moved to these sort of uh, stripped down images in his paintings. And he was, of course, very well known. By that point, he was being you know, talked about in the popular press and that sort of thing, as well as in art circles. So. Um, now, the real art historical question then is, were you in any way influenced by uh, Schiller or any of the artists considered to be precisionists? Uh, what I was definitely very much influenced by Schiller. Uh, name somebody else and I'll tell you. Charles Demuth? Demuth, uh, yes. Yes. Uh, I, that's where the number five came from. Uh, he did a, uh, I think it was a painting. It, yes. I saw the number five in gold. Based and, on the poem by William Carlos Williams. Yes. Uh, that, that was a poem about uh, Schiller. And a fire, a fire engine. And that's where I got the five. 
No kidding. No kidding. Uh, <laughs> well, we're, we're both brilliant then. <laughs> okay, well, this is a lovely image. I think it's very compelling, your use of the uh, rails and, and the tiles that sort of disappear uh, as uh, we go away from the picture plane uh, and the uh, balancing uh, arch semicircle shapes. I mean, that's, this is just a very, I know that you could get the image from looking at one of the uh, metro stations, but this is just such a great distillation into the real essence. Uh, well, uh, the, the original image was actually published in the uh, Washington Post. And uh, I forget whether uh, it was color or not, but uh, it's, well, I had to uh, modify it quite mm -hmm. dramatically. Yeah. Well, that's like, that's sort of the whole point. The, I think when we, when you see somebody that's working in a representational style, how much have they simply reproduced what the uh, inspiration was, the original source? Uh, and in your case, you've substantially transformed it and altered it to um, reveal your vision. And that's part of what makes I think artists uh, successful. Um. In case you're wondering about copyright issues, uh, I took these silk screens down to the uh, Washington Post building and uh, showed them to the their art guy whose name was Paul Richard. Uh, oh yeah, I knew Paul. Yeah. Uh, he's just retired. And uh, every time he didn't say anything about copyright, he said, oh, I'll buy that. Ah, terrific, <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, uh, not I'll buy it, we'll buy it. And so oh, that's, that's terrific. That must've made you feel like you really were on the path of something uh, good. Well, yes, but uh, he never offered to buy one of my photographs. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a shame. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I was really doing much that would have interested anybody at the time that um, I ran into him regularly at the gallery. Um, so, but anyway, that's that's just tremendous, and you're sort of making real leaps and bounds uh, in your art. Let's look at the next image. Oh, here we go. Yeah, before you say anything, I just want to say one thing. You don't include figures very much in your work, at least your work as I've been familiar with it before. So could you kind of use that as a jumping off point, why there are figures, who these figures are, are they personally significant in any way, or, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, well, uh, this is another uh, print based on a Washington Post news photo. Yeah. And uh, I don't, I, in this case also, I don't remember whether the original photo was uh, actually uh, uh, in color. But anyway, uh, th this is one of my very last silk screens. And if you look closely, you can see that all these different areas of color are, some of them are put in solid, but a lot of them are uh, uh, a cross-hatching technique, just like uh, you use with etching. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, substantial number of colors, five or six colors. Uh, each of them having a, a complicated, uh, uh, complicated screen to get it on the paper. And uh, there's a little bit, of, a little bit of a story about the title "Jump for Joy," uh, which is I, I don't know who the uh, photo photographer was, maybe Del Vecchio, maybe somebody else. 
but uh, that's a quotation of a song uh, created by Duke Ellington, the famous jazz musician. And the interesting thing is that uh, the song it does not paint a bright, cheerful picture like this image. Yeah. It's kind of dark, talking about discrimination and this, that, and the other thing. So it was uh, Duke Ellington doing one of his very rare uh, forays into race relationships. Well, that's very uh, interesting to know and makes me wonder, did you choose the title because of the meaning of the lyrics by Ellington or did you simply think it was an appropriate title for the image itself? Uh, so it, that image uh, already had its title, title when it was published in the Washington Post. Okay. So the photographer chose the title. Okay. And uh, it's only uh, quite recently that I discovered the relationship with Ellington. Okay. It's still a good story and uh, it adds uh, kind of a, a breadth to the uh, work itself. I have one question before we move to the next uh, image, and that is the background, uh, because of the uh, intense colors and the um, sort of sensuous forms of the trees, reminds me of uh, what's sometimes called fauvism, which I think you're probably aware of fauvism, you know, oh. early Matisse and, and yeah. that sort of thing. Was that in any way influential on what you were trying to do here with the colors and forms? Uh, not particularly. No, I'm pretty sure that this is not an exact reproduction of the uh, of the photograph. Okay. So the way the trees intertwine and all that stuff, I believe that just came out of my head. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, compositionally, it makes perfect sense. Uh, you know, the boy sort of uh, floating as he jumps from one of these solid concrete uh, forms and the trees and their sensuosity, it's, uh, that, that's even more impressive for you to share with us that that came out of your imagination, uh, not necessarily out of the original photograph. So, all right, uh, is there anything else you wanted to add about this one? No, about, okay. well, it was uh, just about my last silk screen. Okay, well then we're ready for a, a, a transition and a big reveal. So Marissa, let's see the next. Okay. This, the handling of light is what intrigues me, perhaps more than anything else. The shadows or reflections and uh, the, the different density of lines that create those um, uh, transitions and, and contrasts of light and dark. So can you explain what this is? Because I do have a little trouble. Uh, is this uh, these objects placed on a mirrored surface? Or tell us a little bit about it. Uh, well, um, the surface was not a mirrored surface, but it was a white porcelain top uh, table uh, off which we ate breakfast in Omaha when I was a child. And uh, it happens to be right here. Well, it's uh, well, it's over that way. Okay. <laughs> so, did you choose this as the uh, as part of the composition as such an important part because of the personal associations, or was it because it had a reflective surface and you wanted to experiment and, or utilize that? Well, uh, I did a couple of. Uh, uh, of uh, prints uh, based on drawings of objects on this table. And the, the way it works is that um, the table 
was right in front of me in my studio, in my, uh, my study, where I am now. And there's a window out there. And uh, the trees that you see uh, are out there. They did reflect off the table. And then it's a, a still life with a conch and drill, which are sort of uh, contrasting, conceptually contrasting objects. There are reflections. Uh, the rendering of perspective is uh, uh, kind of uh, not too careful. So, for example, you come along, oh, wait a minute, uh, you come along the horizontal line between the real world and the table at the left and at the right. There's no way that those can be parallel on a, uh, a single table. So uh, that's one aspect of it. And then uh, the conch is something that we've uh, we've still got in one of our bathrooms. The drill is something that uh, I have and use all the time. And uh, the scene is what I see out of my studio window. And uh, somehow or other, it just all came together in this uh, image. Is that pretty typical of the way that you uh, uh, create new imagery, things that are familiar to you, that you are able to sort of bring together and uh, arrange the way you wish? Well, I do that quite a bit, yes. Uh, it, I wouldn't say it's exactly typical, but it is something that I do. Sure, sure. And um, is this a, an aqua tent, an etching, or a combination of uh, the different uh, media? It is, uh, to a very large extent, it's a soft ground etching. And the idea there is that you uh, uh, you have a zinc plate that's going to be etched. And the way you get the image onto it is you put a piece of paper over the zinc and then rub on the paper. And what happens is that the gr ground is a soft, uh, a uh, lot of wax in it, so as you rub on it, uh, it the amount of ground that comes off, which translates into the darkness of the image, uh, depends on how hard you press. So that's how you how I got the mm -hmm. image, yeah. and then here and there there are a few actual uh, etched lines where you uh, uh, take a sharp point and uh, make marks with it in the ground. Yeah, just for a point of clarification, I'm not a printmaker. I've never even had my hands on the tools, but of course I know a lot of printmakers and have studied it. So when you press onto the paper and remove it, you take the etching needle to strengthen maybe a line that didn't come through all the way or an area that you want yeah, to it, emphasize, right? You do that, but the yeah. actual tool is uh, uh, what's normally used for burnishing uh, plates where you've made a line that you want to get rid of and you just burnish the plate and so it goes away. Yeah. yeah. And also uh, uh, a lot of the work on the paper was done with just an ordinary pencil, just coloring with pencil. Mm -hmm. Now, why, why did you decide to leave behind uh, silk screening and using photographic images 
as the basis for your printmaking and move into something that is more mm, personal or independent? You know, your own. Why did you do that? I have no idea. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> All right, then let's look at the next image. Uh, well, what happened was that I uh, started taking uh, at the University of Maryland. I started taking uh, courses in printmaking, and uh, uh, I don't believe they really had much of a program in silk screens. So eventually, I. Uh, realized that I had better, if I was going to yep. continue to take courses, I better switch over to something else. Yep. And it was a course in etching, printmaking by etching, and it just grabbed me somehow. Yeah. Good. Well, I do know, uh, because I was in college and graduate school at the time that you're making these changes in your uh, work, that there were a lot of traditional printmakers that thought that silk screening was a commercial process and serious printmakers didn't really do anything with it. So, Well, I've heard of that, yeah, but it had uh, absolutely no bearing on my career. But uh, good, good. Uh, yeah, because shortly uh, during that period, it changed. Warhol and people changed it to uh, where silk screening was regarded as just as uh, valid as a serious art form as any other graphic process. Sure. Yeah. Oh, no, uh, when I saw this, Jim, if I may, the first time that I saw this, I was so impressed because uh, you had added color. And before, I think I had only seen your work in black and white uh, in, in etchings and aquatints and such. And you did this so well. Uh, why did you decide to introduce color into you know, what is primarily a black and white medium? Once again, I really can't say what how it, why it happened, but what uh, did happen, you know, I was lying in bed and all of a sudden the idea came to me on how to put some color into my etchings. And I'll just explain how you do that, how I did that. Okay. Uh, and uh, the way it works is that you have the plate and you make this image in black. And then uh, with uh, with a block out stencil over the parts that you want to be really black or really white and you can see those that all gets blocked out with a piece of paper cut around all the shapes uh, that are not uh, that are not uh, covered with the colored ink and then to get the color in there, I took a big roller, I think maybe uh, maybe five inches in diameter. And so that means that you can uh, cover, you can color a 15 inch swath with color pi times five inches is about 15. And, uh, but you don't color it with a uniform. You first uh, put strips of different colors. And in this case, it was red, orange, and yellow and uh, you roll the roller back and forth on the uh, on the strips until they kind of merge together and you have 
red on one side of the ruler and yellow on the other side of the roller and then you take the roller and roll it over the whole thing and there you have your print you make now, it sound so easy but i know it's not oh i just uh, sweat blood on this thing. <laughs> yeah. uh, well it, uh, and part of the uh, mystique is that you only get to roll once <laughs> if yeah. you try to roll again then it gets all messed up yeah it gets all muddy it gets picks up the black and yeah. transfers it on top of the uh, color and it's yeah. just no good and so uh but anyway uh th this is a very recent print uh I would say uh, maybe uh, 2021 was uh, when it was really being done. Maybe well, you, Jim, you've given me a wonderful segue uh, into what I wanted to ask you to sort of wrap up our conversation. Uh, it's uh, impressive and encouraging and uh, wonderful to see that you in late in life began to make a transition that you've made so uh, wonderfully and, and created these uh, beautiful works of art. Now we're talking about a transition that's happened relatively recently. Where do you see your printmaking going in the future? Do you uh, have some new experiments you want to try or, or what? Well, now remember, I'm an experimental physicist. Okay, <laughs> I, I take your drift. <laughs> well, is there anything you want to add to sort of wrap up? I think we've uh, had a wonderful conversation. I feel like I've uh, learned uh, a great deal more about your art and uh, that will deepen my appreciation of it. But I've also feel like I've gotten to know you a little bit better and uh, what makes you tick. So anything you want to add? Well, I just wanted to comment on uh, uh, waking up in the middle of the night. You have to understand, I was in bed and I had been asleep. And while I was lying there, tossing and turning, that's when the idea came. So, flash of inspiration, right? Well, it has something to do with, with having a very old brain. <laughs> Well, I don't know that your brain seems to be very old at all. Uh, but anyway, I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, talk about your work and uh, your, uh, your, your career. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing the edited uh, project because I think this will be something a lot of people are going to be interested in and enjoy uh, listening to and seeing. Okay, well, uh... Thanks for your comments and questions and for allowing me to uh, uh, give uh, an idea of what I've been doing for the past 50 years. <laughs> well, it's been great talking to you and thanks again for your time. And Marissa, thanks for your uh, support. And we'll look mm -hmm. forward to you sharing with us uh, the results. Yeah, okay. absolutely. And again, Jim, thank you so much for coming here. It's for me to see your work. It, it's really impressive. And before we wrap up, we do need to plug the fact that Jim is one of two MFA artists on view at the Seoul restaurant right now. Yes. And tomorrow, at what time is the reception? Four? Well, the reception starts at four. Yes. Four, four tomorrow, everybody. Four. Uh, well, We'll just say, because this will be after the fact, we'll just say that if you didn't get to see it, you missed a really good, strong show. Uh, well, yeah. it'll be on until uh, May or so, so. Oh, well then people will have oh, the chance fantastic. to see it. So um, and, we'll uh, plug that it's on at Seoul Restaurant until May. You don't have to go to the uh, reception to see the pieces. Exactly. Okay, good night, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you.